So nowadays, more and more people are working and studying from home. Maybe you're one of these people. And while it's absolutely fantastic that we have this flexibility to work and study from the comfort of our own homes, <laughs> oh yeah, what was I saying again? Oh yeah, there's a downside to all of this. It's that, you know, it's getting harder and harder to avoid distraction than actually focus. And if we want to be able to be more productive, then it's essential that we learn how to focus. So I want you to take a look at these two situations. Which one looks more productive to you? Now, what if I told you that what you just saw in situation B is actually a perfect example of productivity? But wait, how can doing nothing be productive? Now, many people believe that productivity is all about doing as many things as possible in the shortest amount of time. However, I much prefer the definition that Chris Bailey, author of the book Hyperfocus, has for it. So he says, productivity is about doing the things you set out to do. In other words, it's when you are able to create a plan and focus so you can complete that plan. So imagine that tomorrow I have just three things that I want to accomplish, which are writing the script for the next video, actually filming the video, and then sending the files of the video over to our video editor. So if I'm able to accomplish these three things, then I can say I had a productive day. After all, I was able to accomplish what I set out or planned to do. Now imagine that my plan for Saturday is just sitting back and relaxing. Now, if I'm able to accomplish that, I'm actually able to have a relaxing Saturday, then that was also a productive day because I was able to do what I planned to do for that day. So in short, productivity is not about doing many things in one day. It's not about busyness. It's about actually accomplishing the things that you plan to do in your day. But before we get into what real productivity actually looks like, I wanted to let you know that if you are new here, every single week we put out new videos like this one that help you to go from being a lost, insecure English learner to being a confident and successful English speaker. So if that aligns with your objectives that you have for your English, then I would invite you to join our community by hitting that subscribe button and the bell down below, and that way you won't miss a single new lesson. So what does productivity actually look like? Now, one of the greatest ways to become more productive is simply to learn to become more focused. Now, that's no surprise, right? If you're anything like me, then you probably have tried and failed at so many different tricks that are supposed to help you be more focused. Now, the problem, the reason you and I are failing is that tricks don't really work in the long term. What you and I need is a system, and the system that we need is called hyperfocus. Now, hyperfocus is when you're able to flow by focusing on just one task at a time over a period of time. I'm sure that at some point in your life, you felt this. Really, time becomes distorted when you're in this thing called hyperfocus. You have no idea if minutes have passed or an hour. You know, sometimes you're in the flow working and you look at the clock and you can't believe how much time has already passed. Now, Chris Bailey talks about three metrics that we can use to measure the quality of focus. So first off is how much time that you're spending intentionally. Next is how long you're able to hold your focus in one sitting. And finally, it's how long your mind wanders before you're able to catch it. Now keep those metrics in mind as we go through the four stages of hyperfocus. Now this is so important because remember, focus is about actually being able to do just one thing. Nowadays, it's very tempting to multitask, but that doesn't really work in most cases. Now, one of my biggest takeaways from this book is something that Chris Bailey repeats all the time, which is intention before attention. Now, what this means is that you need to first think about what you're intending to do, what your goal is, and then, you know, you can actually do the things that will lead to focusing in on it. And this might sound easy, but our tendency tends to be to sit down to work or to study without really thinking about, you know, over the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hour, hour and a half, what is the thing that we want to get done in that amount of time? So actually just before you get started, before you start typing, before you start opening your grammar book and studying, it's really important to think about, you know, over however much time I'm setting aside right now, what do I want to do by the end? All right, so let's say that a task that you have for today is to write an email in English to a customer. And you think that this might take you 15 to 20 minutes. So you're setting aside 20 minutes at least for this task. 
Now it might be tempting just to sit down, open your email and start writing the message. But if you take just a moment before to think about, you know, what's my end goal at the end of these 20 minutes, it's going to help you so much to stay more focused. So for example, it might be that you want to send this email with no errors to that customer. Now doing this is really great because, you know, over the next 20 minutes, your intention is to finish this email. So that means you're not going to answer messages, you're not gonna check your WhatsApp or your Instagram, you're not going to respond to other emails that come in your inbox while you're writing it. You're just going to focus on writing that one email. Now this attention to one task is so important. We tend to get in the habit of multitasking, of trying to do many different things at once because it feels busy. So that makes us feel like we're being productive. But it's actually an illusion because when we do this, we are actually much less effective than when we just focus on one thing at a time. Now let's imagine that you are working in the morning, you have those three things to do. So you have to write an email, you have to respond to some messages from your colleagues, and you also have to create a post for Instagram, let's say. So it might be tempting you know, to jump between these things, to start writing the email, and then to respond to your colleagues, and you know, maybe in the meanwhile, you're also thinking of ideas for what you're gonna post on Instagram. And really one of the scary things here is that it's a vicious cycle. The more that we get caught in this trap of multitasking, of busyness, the harder it is for us not to jump between different tasks because our focus is just so spread out. So the second stage of hyperfocus is to eliminate distractions. Now, why do we get distracted? I really love what Chris Bailey has to say about this in the book. So he says that when your mind is even slightly resisting a task, it will look for more novel things to focus on. Now this is such a great realization because for example, if you are writing that email and maybe you feel some resistance to it because it's in English. So you're having to think more about you know, how exactly you're going to say things and something much more novel, something much easier would be you know, to jump over really quickly and answer some messages of your colleagues, which is in your mother tongue. So that's much easier, but it's distracting away from you focusing and doing a really exceptional job on that email. So Bailey reminds us that it's much easier to deal with distractions in advance than when they've already distracted you. So in the example of writing the email, you might want to actually mute your message system with your colleagues until after you've finished, you know, then you can answer the messages. Just think about, you know, if you're writing the email and you see a ping of uh, someone sent you a message and you, you know, you just go quickly to answer it but then they're going to respond to you. So it actually becomes a much bigger distraction than you were expecting. You thought it'd just be quickly sending a message, but it could end up being a back and forth that actually takes a long time away from writing the email. So what should have taken you maybe, you know, 15 to 20 minutes to write that email, maybe it takes you 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or even an hour. There are two different types of distractions. First off, we have external distractions. Like at the beginning of this video, my phone vibrated and I was tempted to check that message. But you know, what I can do is just turn off the messages on my phone or even put it in airplane mode. And we talked about working or studying from home. And of course at home, there's so many distractions. Maybe you have a dog or you have a child who wants your attention. Now, if this is the case, if you have many things that distract you at your home, which could even just be, you know, the temptation to get up and go to the kitchen uh, instead of focusing on writing that email, then one thing you could do is try getting out of the space that you're normally in. So maybe you go to a cafe and you work from there. It's really just worth changing your environment sometimes just to see how it affects your ability to focus. But those aren't the only distractions, of course. We also have internal distractions. Now, internal distractions are the things that pop up in your head. You know, maybe you are writing that email and then all of a sudden you remember that you have to buy cat food. You're out of cat food. So this is normal. Our brain is always working even when we really want to just focus on one thing. And what Chris Bailey recommends that's worked really well for me is having some sort of capture system. So if you're writing that email and a thought pops up, that's okay. You don't need to, you know, switch modes and like go buy cat food right now, but you can have a pad next to your desk or maybe you have a notepad on your computer, or on your phone, where you can just quickly say, okay, cat food, like write it down or set a reminder in your device so that later when you go to the store or when it's actually the moment for that, you're reminded of it. Now the third stage is actually focusing on that object of attention. And something that can be really useful here is actually setting a timer. So if you have set aside 20 minutes for that email, actually pick up your phone and set a timer there. And we'll look at a technique that is really useful for this in a little bit. And the final stage is continually drawing back your focus to that object of attention. This is very similar to meditation. That's exactly what you're trying to do. It's not trying to empty your mind of thoughts, but rather it's when a thought appears, you're not letting it drag you away. So meditation can actually be a fantastic tool for you to be able to focus more for your English learning and in generally just to live a better life. 
So we did a lesson all about that that I highly recommend you check out and I'll be sure to link it up here and in the description below if you want to check that out. But now you might be wondering, what does this all have to do with learning English? So the great thing about hyperfocus is that it can be applied to anything that you want to be able to better focus on. So we'll take a look in this lesson at two examples of how you can better apply focus to your English studies with the hyperfocus technique. So the first example we'll look at is all about when you're trying to improve comprehension. So let's imagine that you are listening to a podcast in English, like the Real Life English podcast, and you want to actually use that podcast to improve your overall comprehension and your accent. So let's look at this activity through the four stages of hyperfocus. So first off, you're gonna choose a single object of attention. Now, when it comes to listening to a podcast, you might think that just being able to comprehend it altogether, all of the words, not missing anything through connected speech is already you know, a single object of attention. But there's actually so many things coming at you when you're trying to understand another language. You know, there's the pronunciation that you're not used to. Maybe there's the accent that you're not used to. Of course, there's always new words, there's new expressions. There's maybe a use of a word that you know, but you don't know that specific use and so on. So we'll actually look at just one small part of it, which is the musicality of the language. So what I mean by this is you're not gonna focus at all on the vocabulary or pronunciation, expressions, or anything else like that. You're just going to focus on how the speaker's voice sounds. Now, what I mean by this is all the ups and downs, the rhythm, the intonation on certain words, etc. Okay, so I have an example here of Kase speaking on the Real Life English podcast. Let's look at how I would do this with that. Even if it's just a friendly hi. So she said, even if it's just a friendly hi, but I'm not gonna worry at all about the words. I want the music there. So she did something like, <laughs> so you might actually even hum along, you know, trying to capture the music there not worrying at all about comprehending what she said, the message there, just that <laughs> So next, you're gonna eliminate distractions. Now, what might this look like? If you're listening to the podcast on your phone, then you know maybe new messages will come in from Instagram or from WhatsApp or whatever. We're endlessly getting notifications on our phones, right? So it's really good to use a notification blocker. So there are apps like Freedom, Serene, Rescue Time, uh, Self Control. Something else I find really helpful when I'm working on a computer is to close any unnecessary tabs because there could always be the temptation, you know, to pop over to your email or to pop over to another more tempting tab than what you're currently trying to work on. I also love using noise canceling headphones with music playing. That really helps me. I know some people can't handle working with music, so you have to find the right balance of what works best for you. And now that you've set up your environment, you're in a calm place, you have your do not disturb turned on, now you're going to try to just keep your focus on that singular object of attention. So in this case, the musicality of the language that we looked at. And again, it might be helpful to even set a timer. So this is actually something pretty technical of just paying attention to the music of the language. So maybe even just five minutes. And while I mentioned that multitasking in general is not good, one exception to this is if you're doing something very mechanical, you know, something that doesn't require any focus. So for example, maybe you could do this while you're doing something else like washing the dishes or grocery shopping or something like that, that you don't need to focus on that task and you can focus on this and be humming along at the same time. I really like to do this, for example, when I'm running. And once the timer goes off, you're done. You could continue for a little bit more if you want, if you feel like you're really in the zone but you just spent some deliberate time improving your comprehension and your accent with the language. So kudos. Now, speaking of the Real Life English Podcast, one of the best ways to improve your comprehension with it has to be with a real life app. Now, this is because every episode comes with a full interactive transcript, vocabulary definitions, and there's even vocabulary flashcards so that you never forget the new words and expressions that you're learning. Plus, undoubtedly, one of the best ways to remember new words that you learn is by putting them to use as soon as possible. Now, so many learners say that this is a problem because they don't have anyone they can speak with. Well, with the Real Life app, we solved that problem because it's the only place where anytime, anywhere you have an internet connection, you simply press a button and you're suddenly connected to an English speaker in another part of the world for a fun and dynamic conversation in English. So what are you waiting for? It's free to download. All you have to do is click up here or down in the description below, or you can simply search for Real Life English in your favorite app store. Okay, so you could also use hyperfocus when studying something like grammar. So let's imagine that you have a test coming up on the present perfect, and so you're wanting to really focus on studying this. So in the first example with the podcast, we looked at the musicality of the language, right? 
So now let's take a look just focusing in on the past participle of the verb. Now this is the conjugation of the verb we use in present perfect sentences. So you're just gonna focus on the sounds of verbs conjugated in this tense. So for example, gotten, driven, written, gone. Similarly to before, you need to eliminate distractions. So this time you're probably studying with a book. So maybe you want to even put your phone in the other room so you're not distracted to look at Instagram, to look at WhatsApp, to speak to someone on the Real Life English app, for example. Uh, and so you can really just hunker down and focus on your RAM book. You might even tidy up the space that you're studying at. So maybe just having there a drink that you enjoy and your grammar book, a pen to take notes, or as I discussed before, maybe even go to a cafe to study. And listening to simple, familiar music can be really helpful when you're studying. Now, I've heard a lot about Baroque music is something specifically about the way it sounds, helps the mind to focus. You could try that out. There's all sorts of playlists on YouTube and Spotify. And actually, it's really great if you're always using the same playlist or the same type of music when you need to do something that you need to focus on. It's like a cue for your brain to say, okay, we're transitioning to focus mode. So I put in my headphones, I listen to that type of music, and I know now it's time to focus. All right, and then the third step, we've eliminated distractions. So now it's time to actually sit down with our grammar book and focus in on those past participles. And finally, if we get distracted, coming back to that continuously, just reminding ourselves to come back. One thing that I would highly recommend is to actually not just stop there, but now that you've studied it, actually look for it when you're encountering English in other situations. So if you're listening to a podcast or watching a TV series later in the evening to relax, really try to hone in on when the characters are using that tense. Or something else really great you could do is explain what you learned to someone else because this will help you to better conceptualize it and really engrave it in your memory. And by the way, these hyper-focused moments, they're not just gonna happen. So it can be really great to actually plan them ahead of time. Even if it's just, you know, five or 10 minutes, like open your calendar and block off a couple times this week that you want to have a hyper-focused moment for grammar or for listening to a podcast or for something else that's important for your English learning. And I just wanted to finish up this video with a bonus tip that I kind of hinted at earlier. So we talked about using a timer and it's really great to have these periods of where you're in deep focus but then of course your brain's going to get tired from all that focusing and you need refreshing periods. You need to actually take a break and do something that lets your mind rest so then you can come back to focusing again. And something that works really well for this is something called the Pomodoro technique. Now this is basically setting a timer, but there's actually a bit more of a technique to it. So you set a timer and then you take a break and then you set another timer, another break. Now, when you're first starting out, if you're someone who's easily distracted, who has a lot of bad habits of multitasking, then at the beginning, you might find it really difficult to do, for example, an hour and then a 20 minute break. You might need to start with smaller periods. So this could even be 10 minutes and five minutes or 25 minutes and five minutes, for example. Now, the important thing here is that when you take a break, you're not just checking your email or your Instagram or whatever, because these don't really give your mind an opportunity to rest. So what we can do here, let's say that you know, you're at work, you're writing your email, and then you're gonna take a five minute break when you finish. Why not have a conversation in English with someone on the Real Life English app? Or you could listen to five minutes of a podcast or maybe a bit more while you're having taking a break to grab a coffee or something like that. Now, these actually are more refreshing because they force your brain to change gears, uh, you know, from being really focused on something to doing something a bit more passive. And the great thing about this is it can really help you to unleash creativity. So when you take your break, you might want to make sure to keep a notepad or note-taking app handy with you. All right, now I wanna hear from you. What tips from today's video did you find most valuable or that you're most excited to try? Or maybe I missed some tip that you have found really useful to focus better. Be sure to share it with the community down in the comments below. So I wanted to leave you with another really great quote from this book. Uh, Bailey says, we are what we pay attention to. So by being more intentional about what you're paying attention to, you know, you're going to be so much more focused and productive, obviously in your English learning, if you're applying some of the examples we did today, but also with anything else in your life that's important to you. So if you've enjoyed today's lesson, we've just scratched the surface. So I highly recommend that you pick up Chris Bailey's book, Hyper Focus. I'll be sure to share a link to it down in the description below. I absolutely loved it because it helped me to become more focused and creative in my work and other things in life. 
I had so much fun sharing these ideas with you today. I just love reading. And so if you're looking for more books that you can read in English, or you can even read in your mother tongue, but are going to immensely impact your life, then check out this video next. So the first book that we looked at was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, how do you actually even build a good habit or break a bad one? Well, journalist Charles Duhigg got really curious about all these questions and dug into all the science of it, bringing us a book that brings us some down-to-earth stories that help us learn all about how we can replace our bad habits with really good ones. Just to start out with an example, one of the stories that I still remember is that he tells us about a man who lost a lot of weight by creating a running habit. 